They're getting testy. <laughs> what, what's that? There was a lady I was giving the courtesy to sit down. Are we all good? Well, I don't know. Are you good? For the man who needs no, no introduction. <laughs> 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 Welcome to Archer Mayor. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Please mute or turn off your cell phones. I'd like to let you know that the restroom is at the back of the store to the right of the back door. And also the front door is now locked. If you need to leave um, during the program, please use the back door. We keep the front door locked to keep customers from trying to come in while Archer is doing his, his cool show here. <laughs> um, so thanks for coming tonight for the reading and talk with Archer Mayer. He's here to regale us with a tale of Bomber's Moon. It's the 30th book in the Joe Gunther series. But I'm sure he'll have other tales for us tonight too that, that tends to happen. Um, I'd like to thank Orca Media for coming and filming tonight's event. If you'd like to see tonight's video or learn about other events at the bookstore, please sign up on our newsletter, which is being passed around. Um, we do have another author event next Tuesday, October 8th, Scattered Clouds by Reuben Jackson. Uh, Reuben was the host of Vermont Jazz on VPR for many years, and he'll be coming back to read from his new book of poetry next Tuesday. Please join us. Um, so we're happy to have Archer back with us at Bear Pond Books. It's a great fall uh, event that we look forward to each year. <coughs> Archer Mayer is the author of the highly acclaimed Vermont-based series featuring Detective Joe Gunther. Many of you are familiar with him and his adventures. Um, the Chicago Tribune describes uh, the work as the best police procedurals being written in America. Ooh, wow. Yeah, that cost me 25 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> He is a past winner of the New England Independent Booksellers Association Award for Best Fiction, which was the first time a writer of crime literature had been so honored. In 2011, uh, Mayer's 22nd Joe Gunther novel, Tagman, earned a place on the New York Times bestseller list for hardback fiction. And if we all buy a copy tonight, then this one will also be on right? That's how it works? That's how it works, yeah. Um, Archer is currently a death investigator for Vermont's Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Over the past 30 years, he has also been a detective for the Wyndham County Sheriff's Office, a volunteer fighter fight, firefighter EMT, and the publisher of his own backlist, and a frequent contribu contributor to magazines and newspapers. I think the man does not sleep, <laughs> and so we're very happy to have him here. Please welcome Archer Mayer. Thank you. Well, I said earlier you were all gluttons for punishment. I recognize so many faces here. I have no idea uh, why you keep coming back, because I haven't said anything original in years. You know, so, so, uh, which, of course, then introduces the format of tonight, which will, you know, I will imitate an author for a few minutes, uh, and then I will lapse into silence and uh, begin to catch questions, because I, of course, clearly have no idea why any of you would uh, come to see the likes of me. So I'm, I'm dying of curiosity about that. Uh, and, uh, and we'll get to that eventually. But uh, first, I must pontificate a little about the oivre, which is French for egg. Uh, and uh, I think, right? No. Something. No. no. OK. Uh, close enough. Um, Bomber's Moon uh, comes from uh, a World War II phrase that I just couldn't resist. Uh, it actually also belongs to a 1943 truly execrable movie. <laughs> I don't recommend it, uh, but, uh, but it has a really cool title. Uh, and uh, the idea being that back in those days, before infrared and fancy gizmos and seeing things in the night that you shouldn't be looking at, anyhow, uh, bombardiers would fly overhead and they would bless, kind of, the bomber's moon because it basically that's just aviator talk for a full moon. And via a full moon, you can see what city you want to blow up because we were all a little focused in our ambitions in those days. Uh, no one quite put two and two together that if you can see them, they can probably see you. So the irony of Bomber's Moon was so redolent of menace that I, I just couldn't resist it. Uh, so uh, I titled it Bomber's Moon, and I began to write. And then I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to have to explain this sucker somewhere a couple of times in the book, because sometimes in the past, as you 
many of you have discovered, I'll throw in titles of my books that I don't ever allude to. For example, uh, what was it? The, uh, the Second Mouse, one of my favorite titles, only because it was delivered unto me by my cherished daughter. She loved it. I loved it. I thought it was the funniest title on the face of yours. Put it on the book. But I never refer to the second mouse in the book. I have never come across so many baffled readers <laughs> after that book came out, you know. It's clearly one over there nodding like crazy, you know. It's like, what the hell did he mean by that? I actually put a little a little thing in the very beginning, you know, the, all the parts you don't read, you know, acknowledgments and things like that. And there was a, an explanation, but like I said, nobody paid any, that any attention at all. So uh, I don't do that, and I try to work in why the title is the title in the book. So there are a couple of times when I will laboriously lay it out until the point you'll say, I'm not an idiot, just keep on going. So I do. It's a complicated book. Uh, I'm a complicated guy. Uh, so this comes naturally. Uh, this book has so many subplots, even I can't remember them, but uh, somebody dies, and we have to find out why and by whom. Of course, that sort of mirrors what I do with the medical examiners, so that's easy and not a big stretch for me. Uh, we've got uh, a, a dead drug dealer, uh, and it looks like a slam dunk. This is very easy. We've got the guy who did it, and he's, you know, uh, right there and probably named Dwayne. So it's not, you know, not rocket surgery, as a friend of mine once said, my favorite expression. Uh, and he got it. Someone, you know, a lot of people go, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. No, you haven't. <laughs> That's mine. Um, so... Uh, Sooner than later, uh, of course, since it's an Archer Mare book, uh, it ain't going to be that simple. Um, and you may think that so-and-so did in such-and-such, -such, but no, that's not the way it turned out. And Joe Gunther and his fearless crew is going to have to figure out why. So I immediately, having started down that road, I'm just going to move to another road uh, and introduce you once again to uh, Rachel and Sally, who are two best buddies. One's a private eye and one is a budding uh, uh, photojournalist with an emphasis on less on the photos and more on the journalism. I introduced her uh, earlier. She's the medical examiner's daughter, and she was a shutterbug to begin with, but and now she's doing more writing than, than photography. But she's still carrying around a lot of camera gear because uh, I have to refer to her camera gear. Um, and the two of them form a, a team, and they need to find out what the hell's going on uh, sort of on a parallel uh, plot to the dead drug dealer. And I think we've only gotten halfway through chapter two. So you get the <laughs> idea of where we're heading. So uh, don't read late at night. You'll fall asleep like I continually do when I write these books. Um, and. Uh, um, you know, if you got any complaints, uh, write Margo. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of it. Uh, I had a good time writing it, uh, and I had a good time writing number 31, um, which is finished, and I'm editing it as we speak. Well, not precisely, <laughs> but we will be when I get back home, because you're right, I don't sleep, so probably at 3 o'clock I'll be editing. Um, in fact, Margot refers to my editing uh, when I sleep in the middle of the day. That's my editing. So I think you need to go upstairs and edit because your eyes are slits. That's, I, you know, that's the phraseology that I hear. You're a strip for action here, enough of the haberdashery. I only put this on for you guys. Uh, a tweed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Eventually, I'm going to get elbow patches, but that, that'll, be, that'll be book 40. Um, the book mostly mirrors what I do in a lot of these uh, books, if not all of the books, which is to take a kind of a, a, a no reference to Bomber's Moon, but an airplane's view of us. Now, now, I'm by nature an outsider. I look and, and observe and wonder why we do what we do. And in fact, we were having a, a, a dinner uh, conversation just before coming here, and 
there was this about people, you know, doing this to that, and you know, and I was saying, well, maybe they did it for that reason, but maybe they did it for another reason, and I, I'm constantly looking at at inter human interactions in various uh, ways and forms, and I'm always sort of really curious as to why the hell we do what we do. Uh, and this book, along with all of its uh, of its uh, fellows, uh, is uh, sort of consumed in that. And and there are a lot of extremes as a result. So I'll focus. There are mega rich in here, uh, and uh, they're as intriguing and screwed up and weird as the mega poor, whom I also treat. And so we will deal with a lot of extremes in this book, uh, but they are the same extremes that surround us all. And probably, I would argue, inhabit us all, because we have good days and bad days. And uh, we are going to express ourselves in the most curious of fashions, oftentimes to our own astonishment. You know, I, I can't believe I was that good. I can't believe I was that bad, uh, depending on uh, what we were doing and what the reaction is and whether we got away with it. Uh, that fascinates me to the point that I no longer refer to these, not that I really ever did, as whodunits, but why done it's. Uh, the, the motivations or the, the inexplicable motivations of, uh, of people's uh, thought process, uh, processes uh, fascinate me. Uh, just made it. <laughs> I'm a motorcyclist, and so I was just thinking, slow down, brother. <laughs> you have no protection. Um, been there, done that. Uh, so uh, when I'm asked what motivates me, uh, and where do I get my ideas, and, uh, and other questions uh, like that, I'm, I'm fascinated when I hear other authors, with whom I don't hang out much, uh, you answer quite succinctly. Uh, and they've got it all figured out and, and uh, it's all organized and squared away and they know how it's going to end and people actually write books with the conclusion first. I think uh, John Irving, isn't he the guy who said that he writes the conclusion first, the last chapter first, and then he writes towards that. I'd sooner cut my wrists. I, you know, I just... <laughs> God takes all the fun out of it. I mean, I have no clue how these suckers are going to end up. I sometimes get the wrong bad guy. Uh, uh, edit, edit, edit. That's the clue. You know, you read it and you go, what? Oh, God, thank God. I didn't send it off to the publisher yet. You know, so, so you, you turn, twist things around, you yank this out, and you put this in. And the nice thing is that we all have murder in our hearts, whether we acknowledge it or not. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't take much to <laughs> take this guy out and put that guy in, and it works fine. And, and I always love when I've done that, and I've done it a couple of times in this series of books, when people come up to me and say, God, I never guessed it was that guy. And I'm like, <laughs> me neither. <laughs> so, but, you know, it, it, we are on that fine thread. We, you know, you're, you're driving along, someone cuts you off in traffic, and what's the first thing that comes out of your mouth? Something Willie Kunkel would say. Um, and so we're, we're all sort of there. We're not all homicidal maniacs, but we have this proximity to rage and anger and free expression that we normally in more rational moments like to deny. But the savage lurks within all our hearts. Uh, and, uh, and I may be a little more playful with that savage than most of you. <laughs> but I've had, uh, I'd like to hope, uh, more exposure to it than you have. So. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. First question, please. You guys have, you know, I mean, you're used to this routine, and uh, you see, there you go. You have clearly got the five bucks. Yeah, no, I later. I, I was just express. I'm just kidding. I'm a writer, for God's sake. I don't have five bucks. <laughs> Actually, it's not a question about this book. Have, what, could you tell us the name of your new book that's coming? Oh, the one that's coming out, I'm calling at the moment before the editor wakes up and goes, what are you, on drugs? <laughs> uh, I'm calling it the Death Watch Beetle. Oh, ah, I like that. I will tape that and send it to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because usually they respond, the what? You know. But the Death Watch Beetle actually exists. It's primarily located in England and in Northern Europe. You're nodding. You know your bugs. Good, sir. 
Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a lovely critter. Um, it's, it's kind of a pseudo termite without actually being a termite, but it's a bug that, that likes to consume wood, old British wood. <laughs> so you've got these nice, you know, eight inch by eight inch beams in something that uh, Shakespeare was too young to appreciate. Uh, it's been there on the sodden earth forever and ever and ever. Uh, and, and until you push your hand against it and your whole fist goes right through the 8 by 8 beam because the Death Watch beetle has been hard at work, invisible and, except in a unique circumstance, not noticed at all. But you can notice this beetle at night when you're very, very quiet, such as, in the old days, at a wake. Okay, so there you are, draped in black, you and the stiff, who's not putting up much of a fuss. And you hear this. And you begin to think, because of course the Catholic Church has beaten the hell out of you and sort of educated you in weird things, that this must be the devil or God or the countdown or, you know, <laughs> life ebbing out or whatever. And it was long before Timex was invented, so that was ruled out. And so people began to think that it was God's countdown, therefore the death watch beetle, okay? Well, and of course they didn't have plumbing in those days, so at least not the kind of plumbing that makes noise like our plumbing does. The irony uh, of the whole thing, of course, is it had nothing to do with death. It had everything to do with sex, because the beetle was just sort of horny, and that's how they express themselves. Unfortunately, by banging their heads against wood. <laughs> so um, they're energetic little critters, and at night, you know, they're expressing themselves like many people do at night, uh, and they're kind of, hey, Stella! You know, they're looking for some company. Uh, only they have this sort of unique and peculiar way of doing it. And so the linkage was made. Now, how the hell am I going to put that in a book, you may ask? Yeah. Well, I mention it two or three times in the book in context, I'd like to think. But I haven't gotten that part in the editing yet, so uh, right now I think it works perfectly. But you be the judge. We're probably all going to meet next year here, and you can tell me what a terrible job I've done with my title. But that's, that's the answer to your question. <laughs> you see how this works. One question, we're here for 40 minutes. We're good. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Willie Coco, such a well-developed character. I know him well, and I wondered if you had patterned him on an individual or whether this is part of you. Well, isn't that prescient and observant? And uh, do we know each other intimately? We, I think we do. <laughs> because uh, most people have all thought that uh, Willie Kunkel, well, you know, I mean, it, oh, let's be honest, we all know Willie Kunkel. Okay. The, the, the one phrase that, I'm, that I never encounter is, oh, I so love Joe Gunther. I work with Joe Gunther. He reminds me of my father. And, but, and nobody knows Joe Gunther. Joe Gunther is so goody two-shoes, he's an impossibility. But we all know Willie Kunkel. I, how many people have come to me, especially cops, saying, oh, I work with Willie Kunkel. I wish the hell they'd fire him, you know. Uh, but my daughter uh, was, like, once again, run her up the flagpole. Um, she was the one who very, very, very early on said, oh, my God, am I the only one who knows you're really Willie Kunkel? <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to be Joe Gunther. I would like to think that everybody in this room would like to be Joe Gunther unless you're a real heel. Because why not be the nicest, most avuncular, most you know, pleasant, most team player dude in the room? I mean, this guy is a friggin' saint. <laughs> and uh, Willie Kunkel? <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I have heart and soul. I'm Willie Kunkel. Oh, absolutely. I fight to control myself on a daily basis. I, you know, I, I've told Mar poor Margo, so I, I walk a tightrope between anger and despair. <laughs> that sort of brings me to Willie Kunkel. <laughs>
But thank you for keeping me on that guy wire. You know. Occasionally, Margo has to serve a little too much despair, a little too much anger. Yes. But so far, I'm keeping my balance. Thanks again. Who else? Well, I, I was a buzzkill, wasn't it? Yes, sir. <laughs> summer evening and you started off with your introduction as why is why the heck is every all these people here on a beautiful night like this <laughs> and I wanted to say well because of all the talks I've gone to see you with it's either raining or windy <laughs> or it's in October <laughs> and, it was per and tonight this if we don't get rain after we leave this might be the second time that I've been to your talks where the weather is hilly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad someone's keeping track. <laughs> yes, sir. My wife was born and raised in South Amherst, Massachusetts. We are both very curious about how you happen to incorporate Park Wine Lane and Mount Tom in one of your mysteries. Yeah. How did that happen? How well, about it, visiting that part of the town? See, the, this is the beauty of, of driving without a map, and I would even argue without headlights, uh, you know, at night. Uh, I, I am a, a chaos driver. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the air traffic controller with no radar and no windows. I, I don't put down a plot. I don't write down notes. I don't um, do, do an outline. I, I come up with uh, some ignorance, of which I have a plentiful supply, and I begin to ask myself, am I curious enough about the answer to the questions that I have within to spend a year researching it and answering those questions? And if the answer is, yeah, because one curiosity is going to lead to another and whatnot, then, then I begin interviewing people okay. and of course they have to reside somewhere so I go to where they reside and I chat with them and I look around and I put them in the company of their environment and I begin to develop questions about that too so maybe I have questions about a, a, a library yep. well maybe that library is behind seven foot thick concrete lead lined walls you have to ask why, right? Well, because it's an old NASA 1950s backup uh, nuclear uh, facility that the, that the university just happened to buy because they're hard to sell. Uh, and so the university picked it up for a song and moved books in there. So here's something that's designed to protect the free world. That's supposedly what we're inhabiting uh, from you know the bad guys. And instead, now it has books. Revenge is sweet, you know. So uh, that, needless to say, gets my creative juices flowing. And of course, since I'm a kind of a director, uh, movies of the of the mind, if you will, I see scenes as well and people interacting in these physical settings. Scary scenes. Exactly. Scary scenes. So. I often wonder if you're going to come out alive. <laughs> well, I do too. Since I don't have a plot, I often don't know. You know, are they going to survive or not? And I swear, I swear to God, I remember, I can't remember my own titles, unfortunately, but somewhere in the previous books, I knock off one of Joe's girlfriends. And okay. if you haven't, the awful, see? Yeah. I, I had an impact. It was the last page. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like right at the end, that was like, that was. Yeah, wrong. I'm wrong, wrong. But and yet here you are. So that, that works for me. Thank you very much. I appreciate your sacrifice. Uh, so I'm writing that sentence. Well, you there. Thought of that before? No. Someone was going to die, but I, I hadn't quite figured out who. And and then you write the sentence. Well, I write the sentence, and I stopped and went. Wow, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and then I went, well, but there it is. So I've got to write through it. That's what life does. OK, the screeching brakes, the brakes failed. He goes into traffic, boom, different story. 
and it, we're all hanging by a thread. And of course, I see that. I mean, last week I did seven dead calls, as I call them, wow. all hanging on threads, you know, and I get to enjoy the fruits. Well, I mean, they're going to die anyhow, so it doesn't make me particularly morbid. Someone's got to pick up what's left around. So I do it and I enrich myself as a result because I spend time with the living. The dead are dead, but the living are chroniclers. They tell me everything about the person, everything about the circumstances, everything about the background, everything about led, led up to it. Uh, that's, I, that's why they call me an investigator. You're picking people's lives apart and finding out what makes them tick. Well, I write the same way. I write like a blank slate filled with curiosity and I let other voices and suggested imagery and a variety of scenarios present themselves and I sort of either pick some or I get picked by others depending on what my characters and circumstances dictate and I'll just follow the crowd, if you will, taking notes and writing minutes. And at the tail end, I've got 300 pages and it's got a beginning and a middle end because I'm actually not a bad air traffic controller. Now, I've, I've sort of figured this out. It's been 40 years, so <laughs> yeah, I, I should have some skill sets. And then I do what depresses high schoolers as far as I've ever met by having to tell them that, yes, you finished your, your writing, you're halfway done. And their faces fall because, of course, I'm talking about the editing and the rewriting. That's where you put the polish on. That's where you cut out all the, dare I say, crap. Um, <laughs> because you've loved yourself. You've, you've been eloquent. You've been curly-cued with your <laughs> magical words. And you've, of course, put in several extra syllables into every flippin' word because, hmm. But now you're an editor and a reader, and it's all just awful. So, uh, you know, you shorten, 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 and tighten, 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 uh, and uh, turn it into something whereby you do two paradoxical things as a writer. You sweep away your readers with your language on one hand, if, you're, if you've paid attention, but you also completely vanish. This is supposed to be your gift to the reader is that you disappear. When you're lost, you're lost, in the novel. you're lost in the novel. It's your novel. It's your story. And I don't exist. The only way I'll exist is if I screw up. One polysyllable too many, one factoid messed up. You know, I, I put the, you know, Montpelier, you know, I put it east of Barry. And you're going to go, what? You know, <laughs> boom, the fictional daydream stops. You straighten slightly and you go, Archer Mare, what an idiot. You know, <laughs> now it's my book. Okay, right. and that's, <laughs> see, so, the, so the, that's, that's the idea. And that's why you have other people reading. Yes, you. yes, that's precisely right. So by the time I send that manuscript down to New York, they think I'm a hell of a writer. <laughs> because it's been sent out to five, six, eight different editors, one of whom is standing right there, and they are the toughest bunch that I can get my hands on. My mother, bless her heart, is now dead, so I don't have to listen anymore to, oh, well, that's very nice, dear. <laughs> no, the idea of an editor is, uh, well, it was okay, but uh, on, uh, on chapter one, page one, paragraph one, I, you know, <laughs> That's what I want to hear, because I take full responsibility for the thing. If I don't actually like your comment or agree with your comment, I, I can not pay any attention to it. But chances are you're going to say something, maybe even not intentioned, that I'm going to go, I'll be damned. That makes me think that I should have done something this way instead of that way. It's going to be good. It's going to be improved by your comment whether directly or indirectly, it doesn't matter. So if I've got five or six people like that, 
all weighing in from their different you know, viewpoints, life experience. So I get cops, I get editors, I, I, I get uh, just generalists, uh, you know, I get grammarians. Uh, and they could care less what the story is. They hate dangling participles, you know, so <laughs> they're going to jam me up for that. And I will either go, no, nah, I'm sorry, that's in quotes. Willie Kunkel's allowed to speak any way he pleases. <laughs> but if it's not in quotes, well, then okay, we're going to have to fix it up. You know. And it, it's a fun process. It's a great fun process. And, and people will come to me uh, not terribly long ago and said, well, I always have to keep both hands free when I read one of your books. I went, Okay, what is this? Martial arts? You know? <laughs> they went, no, 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 because I read with one hand and I have a dictionary in the other. <laughs> and, I, and I sort of went, oh, is this good news or bad news? No, 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 no. I, I love the language. It's great. I just don't always understand it because you use words that I'm not used to. And I like the words and I like the sound of the words, but I sometimes have to look them up because I, I, I don't use them all the time. And to me, that's, that's a magic element. I remember a, a book reviewer a while back uh, reflecting on one of my novels. And um, she, she sort of took a break from talking about the book in general and, and said instead, um, has there, or I, or I have, whoever she was, never or rarely read a passage about falling snow captured it quite as well as this. And she just put down the paragraph that talked about falling snow. And then she followed it by saying, that's wicked good writing. <coughs> you know, and I can, I can, there you, have you broken the fictional daydream? Well, kind of, but it's okay <coughs> because in that one you've given the reader an additional gift. So if the reader pauses to go, wow, far out, that you can live with. You don't want to go the, the opposite direction where they just wing ding the book across the room, which I've done so many times. I mean, I know what it's like to be a reader who's been disrespected by the writer. And we'll all do it, but I will try really hard not to. Okay, that, that's my, my uh, contract with you. Who else? Yes, sir. In that 40 years of writing, how has the onslaught of technology changed your approach, or has it? Well, uh, to a limited extent. I mean, I, I mean uh, in terms of the grand world of technology, I'm the guy with the flip phone that's turned <laughs> off. So technology doesn't jam me up too much because I, dare I say, issue it. <laughs> However, I was one of the very first users of a computer. And I'm not talking portable computer because I'm a dog of a certain age. Um, I bought one of the very first box-like computers. It happened to be a Macintosh. I, I don't care about Macs and PCs. It's not an interesting conversation to be, but it, it happened to be a Macintosh. It's the same Macintosh that you can now see that has been turned into uh, fish tanks. <laughs> I think it's a sort of an eloquent piece of recycling. Um, but I, I have a woodworking shop, so I like to build stuff as well. It's a kind of a right brain, left brain thing. And I made a carrier for this non-portable computer. <laughs> and I would travel around the United States, because in those days I was writing history books, and I had to do massive amounts of research for these non-fictional books. Uh, unless you think that most history is fiction, but that's a different, <laughs> that's a different topic. Uh, and the reason that I committed myself very, very early on to this piece of technology was because I was brought up old school. I used to write books longhand on legal pads. Now, that's fine. You got to get the words out somehow or another, and if technology is a pencil, well, then you stick with a pencil. But I'm an editor, and I like to get in there and change and change and change. And I will, through this editorial process, whether it's me or all these other folks tied in with me, I might do 15 to 20 edits of each 300-page book. So there's a lot of rep repeating and going back and back and back. Now, if you type, 
on an old-fashioned manual typewriter, and I've got three in my house, if you want to change something in a piece of TypeScript, then you're going to have to retype all 300 pages. So how many edits are you going to do of that book? Not 15 to 20. You're going to do, at the most, three. Now, is that a fully edited book? No. You just wore out. Your fingertips were bleeding, and you got sick and tired of it. And finally, you got to the point where you saw changes, but you didn't make them because you don't want to retype that whole bloody chapter. So you just kind of go, eh, it's close enough. It's not close enough. Computers allow you to edit, edit, edit. OK, so here's another thing that made me an advocate of computers. If some of you can remember, <laughs> back in the days of old-fashioned editing, you, you crossed out, you did arrows. Sometimes you might even whip out a pair of scissors and, and tape. You know, cut and paste was not a metaphor. Uh, and and uh, so you, you would read this manuscript, and your eyes were damn near crossing, because you're, you're going, OK, uh, you know, he did this, he, he went, uh, no, hang on. Uh, no, he went, OK, arrow, he went there, and he, OK. So when you're reading a book, one of the things that's so seductive about reading is that language becomes musical, or at least cadenced, in your head. That's one of the things that keeps you reading, is that there's an expectation of rhythm. So you read on, and you keep turning those pages, not because you're aware of turning pages, or even of translating words in your head. It's because you're following the symphony of language. OK? That's fine. But if you're editing your own symphony of language, you've got to see all the notes lined up. Well, all that cutting and crossing and scotch taping and arrows and, and all the rest of it, as an editor, as a creator of that musical language, if you will, or language music, uh, you can't maintain that rhythm because it's not rhythmically laid out. Computers, for all their approximation to coldness and distance and, and, uh, and lacking in humanity, in fact, if you look at them in a paradoxical way, they can make that language and that music apparent with a single keystroke because there are no crossouts. It just disappears. And therefore, as you look from word to word to word, that's introduced until you go, oh, no, I want to change that one. It disappears, back to counting the rhythm. So it's, it's a lovely process as far as I'm concerned. And I was more than willing and able to carry this, this doorstop uh, of a device. And then they, you know, they heard my complaints and they invented the portable computer. Thank you. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. It's the least I could do. I figured a couple of other people might enjoy that, so what the hell, right? Along that vein, yes. does your wife send you upstairs so that you can read your supposedly last edited version out loud to hear it? No. You'd like to hear be, be, it? No, no I, I don't. I don't do it out loud because when I read, I don't read out loud. Yeah, right. That's the, that's the funny part is that this symphony has to be silent. This cadence, this appreciation of music has to be inside your head. Now, maybe you could do both. You know, and I could open this and I could read. And, you know, it would approximate what you're hearing inside your head, but it won't actually be exactly the same. You focus more if you're quiet. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's a, more, it's, a, it's a more proximate experience to what you're going to, I hope, enjoy down the line. Mm -hmm. So I try to put myself in your place as much as I possibly can. Because no writer knows what it's like to read her or his own work. That's the biggest obstacle for us as writers. Okay? So 
you write these things, you edit these things. If you're me, you spend a whole flipping year with these things. That, that's not much work for a year. <laughs> but by God, every day I'm at it. I know this inside out. I know everything that didn't go into it. I know everything that I pulled out of it. I know the wrong bad guy. <laughs> I know stuff you'll never know. Will I ever have an outsider's appreciation of this work? No. So the trick that I need to enact is to create a book that will be to the uninitiated as interesting, as seductive, as enticing as I hope I can make it. But I can't actually share that experience because I've never read one of my books. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a trick. <laughs> And that's why I depend on you guys. And I depend on reviewers. I mean, people say, oh, no, I never read bad reviews. Oh, God, I sure as hell read bad reviews. I want to find out what it's like, because I have no clue. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Well, could I say that I did not find Joe Gunther to be the way you described him? <laughs> Absolutely. How do you find him? I like him a lot because I find him very down to earth and not a saint. Good. So, uh, you know, I never thought of him as being a good guy. Yeah. I, I thought of him as being um, very realistic with his pluses and minuses and good. handling women was good. difficult for him and he admits it. He admits yeah, it. Good. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. Uh, you know, part of what I say is for effect. <laughs> you know, there is a... I mean, I'm a bit of a showman. Really? I'm also, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be so brutal. I, I sprung that on you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a covert guy, so I'm, 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 I'm often going to speak other than how I feel or what I truly believe. I sometimes get on a roll and... So I'll describe Joe Gunther uh, in the way I just did. I actually feel about him more as you do. I designed Joe Gunther from the very first book with one among many, but one primary characteristic, and that is that he would screw up, always. He knew how to atone. He knew how to say he was sorry. And that was key, the double key. You know why he's named Joe? Because it's the most boring name I could think of. <laughs> I wanted him My to be. Really? That's right. Just, just walk on by. Walk on by. <laughs> So Joe was a regular Joe. Remember, when I was brought up, that was the phrase, a regular Joe and Willie. Remember from, uh, from Malden? Uh, that ages me. But um, so that was the image I wanted to get. I couldn't use Bob. That was just too much. But Joe, Joe had, you know, had a certain cachet to it after all. So there you go. <laughs> You're close by and you have a cane, so I'm going to suck up a little bit. You know, I don't want to get hurt. Um, so I think in the, in the first book, I have him commit a number of not egregious errors, but it was important that he do so. And on the second book, Borderlines, he's already had a major fallout with his girlfriend, Gail, and he's heading up to the Northeast Kingdom and he's licking his wounds. And this was a key part of his personality. Now he's been with us for so many years that I, I allow him to fade a little bit more into the background because of now we've established his personality to such an extent that I, I wanted the stage to be a little more populated by tangential uh, characters. And so I've, I've done that and I've also widened 
uh, the uh, the cast of characters accordingly and, and introduce some uh, some younger, fresher blood. Um, but Joe is always going to be there. So um, I actually thank you for suggesting that correction. So that was a good call. That's a good call. You had a question in the back. Yes. Graciously. Yeah. And uh, you know, Joe Gunther translates really well, and, and on, well, not all books do. And I just wonder, have you have you listened to your books? Maybe? Well, um, how do you feel about that media as opposed to yeah. you know, the classic version? Of thank, thank goodness there is, as I referenced earlier, an approximation between the inner reading and the outer reading, and the, 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 by, the, by by sheer definition, they're going to be somewhat proximate. Uh, but when it comes to who reads my books aloud, well, you know, I'm, I, I, I am not Stephen King who picks up the phone and he says, that person's going to read my books. No, the phone goes dead if I do that. So <laughs> a lot of this is on bended knee and please, could you make him understandable? You know, so we, we, don't, we don't ask for impossible bars. Margo's really good at this. She, she pursued this with, with some vigor, and we've gotten uh, much better readers as, as we've progressed through the series. But this was on the coattails of, uh, and you can still get these audible books. I can't remember his name now. I, I, should, I won't even say his name because then, of course, you're going to skip buying these Audible books. But there's one guy who literally exemplifies why certain actors are called hams. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, my name is Gunther. <laughs> Joe Gunther, and I'm just <laughs> so I I don't listen to books on tape, you know, and of course I don't. Well, not of course, but I don't read fiction. I read history, or uh, or science books, or technological books, and that's just to get out of my own head. Um, so when I late in the game discovered this guy for some reason, popped him into the CD player. And, and damn near left the road. Just think, <laughs> oh my God, you know, who, who is this clown? And, and so, you know, Margo made that threatening phone call. Tough woman on a phone. Um, and uh, this individual stopped recording for us. <laughs> and now we've got a, another guy. And I, his name totally escapes me. I have the slightest idea. But I think the majority of the books are, are read by people, uh, you know, closer to the mark. But, gee, you know, What's your name? J.K. Rowling? Yeah. yeah okay. Well, so Rowling, she can buy the best that the British theater has ever produced. I can't. <laughs> so, um, but, I, but we can get a decent reader. Uh, and I guess having cut our teeth on Mr. Ham, uh, <laughs> we, we had only up to go. And so we, we've gone up. Uh, and I, th I think that's that's a good deal. I share your pain. I was uh, trapped on, in, a, in, a, in, a, in traffic on my way to Philadelphia, which was the 412-hour uh, drive, and I uh, and I had I had heard about this the Da Vinci book. Okay, so I popped that into the machine and thought, oh, what the hell? Everyone's talking about this thing, and uh, so what? We'll we'll give Mr. Brown a hear. Now, the, the recommendation for this book, and I don't mind dissing him because he's richer than creases, so, you know, sue me, baby. Uh, you can have my old truck. Um, I was recommended The Da Vinci Code by a bookseller who said, you just can't put it down. It's a complete and utter page turner. Oh, it's terribly written, by the way. <laughs> it reminded, yeah, well, it reminded me of when an ex-mother-in-law of mine, as a gift, bought me a subscription to Reader's Digest. <laughs> you know, it's one of those. 
thank you, but no thank you. <laughs> so emasculating books is really not my strong point. So, um, so I, I popped this thing in. Okay, so that's just Mr. Brown and, and my opinion of his purple prose. But this was a, an audio book. And with all that money, because it had already become a bestseller, so it was a big deal, and there was cash to be spared. Now, I don't know how many of you, I'm really belaboring the hell out of this, but you know, <laughs> hey, it's my evening, so. Um, uh, as you may recall, a good part of the Da Vinci Code takes place in France. The Louvre. Paris, Villeneuve, words like that, OK? <laughs> the reader didn't speak French, had no clue how to pronounce anything in French. Yeah, I was stunned. <laughs> I mean, really? So that was sort of a, an education in the audio arts. So I, I think we've done gooder than that. <laughs> yeah. well, yes? Um, uh, you say that you don't really read fiction, but um, do you have any favorite authors or writers of nonfiction that you like to read? Well, I, you know, I cut my teeth on that a long, long, long time ago. I haven't read fiction in years, so I, I don't really have the slightest idea what's going on nowadays. Uh, but I, but I was introduced to this kind of fiction early on, much like anybody else. But I, I, I you know, uh, my taste buds were such to find Agatha Christie of no particular interest, good puzzle maker, you know. But but to my taste buds, a crummy writer. I mean, perfectly efficient. She got the job done. But I didn't care about any of the characters because they were, in fact, whodunits, not whydunits. And, and that just, that's my taste bud. So I would go to, I guess, what was then called a sort of a darker uh, Dashiell Hammett, uh, Raymond Chandler. Uh, uh, his real name is Kenneth Miller. What's his fake name? Um, uh, he wrote the Lou Archer books. Uh, Damn, uh, that's pretty ironic that the guy writes under, writes under a pen name and I can only remember his real name. <laughs> Nobody knows him by his real name. But anyhow, Ross McDonald. Ross McDonald. No one's ever heard of him anymore. I read everything by Ross McDonald. That's why I'm such a success. I read nobody's. Uh, but he wrote something like 18 to 20 books. And, and he, was, he, he had a, a voice that I really appreciated. And he talked much more about where people come from and what motivates them and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I uh, read those guys uh, more than I did uh, uh, you know, the real the, the problem solvers. Uh, you know, I was impressed by them. I won't take that away from you. I, one of the biggest challenges of writing these books sometimes is coming up with a really neat, you know, pull the rabbit out of a hat thing. I stink at that. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a magician, and I don't know how to confabulate a plot so that uh, Mr. Jones walks in at the tail end and goes, voila, uh, you know, and, and we all go, Oh my God! I never would have guessed. I I just can't do that. I'm stink at that. So I'm a you know I'm a retired cop for God's sake. I plod along and I I follow the evidence, the facts, and, and I put it together, and and that's what I write. Now every once in a while, uh, you know, in the real world, we get surprised. So these guys will get surprised too. But but I'm I'm not a big magician. As a medical examiner, yes, sir. What was your background to qualify? We needed a background. <laughs> Who knew? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it does sound reasonable, doesn't it? Well, in fact, it's not particularly. So, there are two systems in the entire United States. One's a coroner system, and one's a medical examiner system. You are all blessed, my children. You have a medical examiner system. Count yourselves lucky. Of course, you'll all be dead, but don't worry about it. <laughs> Medical examiner systems are, in fact, confabulated pyramidically out from 
doctors. So when I ship one of you north, which I hope I don't have to do soon, uh, you will be autopsied by my boss, the chief medical examiner, or one of his deputies, or whatnot. A coroner doesn't even need to be a doctor, much less a pathologist. A coroner uh, just comes from an old-fashioned political system. They need to hire forensic pathologists to do the autopsies. So they're, they're just politicians, which is fine. And some coroner systems work fine, like the one in Las Vegas. Uh, but um, they oftentimes are prone to being cumbersome and inefficient. Medical examiner systems work better. So here we've always had a medical examiner system. Now, you got the doc. He, she, or it is in Burlington. And we don't have too many of them, about two or three at the most. Uh, right now, two. Uh, and uh, therefore, they can't go out on the scene because there are lots and lots of people dying every year, and they need to be looked at by the eyes and ears of the medical examiner's office. That's me. Okay, so somebody quite wisely in the midst of all this process, because you're right, it used to be doctors, doctors, doctors. And so uh, someone would die in Montpelier, for example, and the phone would ring, and Dr. Bob would pick up the phone, and they'd say, Dr. Bob, someone died under his tractor. Could you check him out and declare him dead? Because that was, that was the letter of the law. And so he would then, five hours later, because he had a room full of patients, so he had to process the patients, and then he goes to see Bob, I mean, uh, the you know farmer Fred, who's rather colder and stiffer than he was when the phone call was made. And he goes, yep, he's dead. You can imagine what the surrounding cops said in response to that. <laughs> Begins with no shh. That was, you know, okay. So uh, somebody whispered into the chief's ear, they're dead. They don't need a doctor. <laughs> Bingo. So they went back to the wording of the legislation and nowhere does it say that this needs to be investigated by a doctor. So they no longer are. People who have a fondness for putting things on their belts, kind of like this, they were dragged off of paramedics, hospitals, nurses, EMTs, people with medical background, people who are predisposed to helping people out in the streets, in the snow, in the middle of the night, and who come onto a scene and rather than saying, where's my white gown? They just roll up their sleeves, get dirty, and get to work. That's who the medical examiner went, oh, I want these guys on board. So the whole system was reconfabulated in 2001, and everyone was asked to come on board of the likes of me, we now, I believe, have no doctor investigators left. We have the two guys, um, Elizabeth Bundock and Steve Shapiro uh, in Burlington, and then the small army of about you know, 35 to 40 of us. And we're f sprinkled all across the state, and we're the guys who respond 24-7 and uh, figure out why you died? What happened here? We need to explain what was unexplained. So, okay, you may be 104 years old, you got a pack of cigarettes in one hand and a bottle of bourbon in the other. Smiling. Well, golly gee, you're also 109 years old, so what killed you? Old age. Yeah, but then I rolled you over and you got a knife in your back. <laughs> Someone needs to roll them over, and that's us. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and we find them every once in a while. Some nephew got ticked off. You're going to live forever? Okay. You know, I want to inherit that truck. People kill each other for the damnedest reasons. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes, ma'am. ever get knocked down so you know depressed like just no able to work 
I have a lot of really good reasons to get depressed that have nothing to do with my writing. <laughs> <laughs> so trust me, I can go there anytime I want. <laughs> no, the writing is, um, you know, uh, with all due modesty, I'm a pretty good sheetrocker. Okay, I know how to tape and float, and by the time I've hung a room for you, yeah, I may have messed up the rug a little bit, and maybe you're going to notice a piece of tape curling over there, and, and there might be a few wrinkles that could have benefited from some extra sanding. But by and large, it's going to be a, a pretty good room. I write pretty good books before I even start the editing process. I'm an old dog. I've been at this for 40 years, full time. If I wasn't pretty good at it, I should change careers. <laughs> so, uh, you know. Please don't. Oh, I won't now. Oh, my God. I mean, what the hell am I going to be good at? You know? well, well, I'm not bad at the dead thing, but. <laughs> but what about in the beginning when you were starting out? Yeah, well, you know, that's absolutely true. So, what do I have very near where I write in my office? I have a, a filing cabinet drawer that is approximately that full of the most unreadable tripe known to literature. My early purple prose. Back in those days, I, I would write a manuscript, and of course, just like any budding writer, you know, I'd pull it out of then the typewriter and neaten it all up and think to myself, whoa. <laughs> 250 pages and not one looks like the other. That's cool. I've done good typing here. Send it off to the manuscript, because, to, the, to the editor or the agent or whoever it is, because Johnny Depp, watch out. You're about to get a, a neighbor who's going to own the island next to yours. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm hot. This is good. And I routinely got rejections along the lines of, uh, uh, dear Mr. Mayor, this is close to the worst book I've ever read. <laughs> you know. Well, it wasn't the but, worst. <laughs> no, no, exactly. Ex see, 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 for all this presumed pessimism, for all this, this font of willy kunkelism, I had hope. I was an optimist, God forbid. You know? So uh, I would look at a response. I'd interpret it first like that, and then this idiot editor, agent, whoever it might be, who was very well brought up, would always put in that phrase along the lines of, but you have a nice voice. <laughs> That's all I wanted to hear. Yeah. I was good to go for another 250 pages of typing, you know? So I did it again, and I did it again, and I did it again. Now that's just drive, that's just being in love, that's just finding what you need to do in life. You know, uh, I have a friend of mine who's a car mechanic. This guy is wicked smart, but he loves being a mechanic. I mean, you just you, you look at him in a car, and he's at one with that thing that I can't stand to be around. It has blood gushing from my knuckles written all over it. <laughs> But not him. He's good. He knows every bit and part of it. Well, that's, that's me with these. I can't write an email without thinking about how I'm picking and wording the, you know, the sentence. And, you know, I sort of look, and then I hit send. It matters to me. It's music to me. And sometimes my emails will be, yup. But I thought about the impact of that one word. Or I wouldn't have written it, and then I would have written a full sentence. But who's getting it? What's the context? What sentence am I finishing that came at me that I respond with a yup, etc. This is a communication. Writing is, in fact, not an isolated sport. You conduct it in isolation, but you don't write in order to be isolated. You, you write to people. 
you write, if you're lucky, to lots of people. So there's an exchange going on. It's odd because the, the audience of your performance is a year out, and they'll be reading it in your absence. But nevertheless, it's a performance. It's a delivery of, of, of artistic competence that you want your readers to appreciate. So there's back and forth. Part of my writing is based on the principle that you are all storytellers. All of you have imaginations. All of you have stories in your head. Part of my job is to give you three quarters of a story that you can fill out and fill in with your own imaginations. That's what makes a, a book hard to put down is because of your personal investment. You supplied the voices. You supplied the descriptors. You supplied the, oh, God, I know exactly what he's talking about. All that extra stuff comes from your creative minds. And thus, we're doing it together. It's a cool process. You have to be just a little bit nuts, however, to do it. <laughs> okay, one more, one more. Yes? Are, are you seeing it all as you write it, at chapter by chapter? Are you seeing it in your head like a movie? I do have a visual imagination, yes. That's true, yeah. Because along with all the sound stuff that I've alluded to, um, I actually started telling stories photographically. Um, uh, my father uh, took photographs all the time. He was a, he was a shutterbug, not, not a great uh, shooter, but he had that, that eighth of a second that a lot of photographers lack, which is he could see in the future by an eighth of a second. He could see something coming. So if, if there was that photograph of, of that guy doing this, he would grab the camera and click just then. And he was, he was very good at catching the pictures. Sometimes they're out of focus and he was lousy in the dark room and all the rest of it, but he had that knack. And, and I liked that and I recognized that at an early age. And so I began to steal his cameras, uh, uh, which, you know, in my case are brownies and God knows what. You know, you start in the 50s, so, you know, they get what you get. And um, that was my first storytelling. But I, but I discovered ev eventually that I was a better writer than I am a photographer. I can only take my photography so far. And then I realized it's, it's OK. It's not, it's bad. It's not bad. But it's no way close to those photographs that people take who really know their stuff and it just pops out. Mine don't pop. They're, they're, they're nice. They're okay. You know, but, um, but my writing, I hope, is better than my photography. Uh, and, but I, I never gave up the, the visual self with which I entered the creative world. Uh, and before I went to writing from photography, I used to draw terrible, terrible stuff. I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing impressive. Um, and uh, I, I was on the road all the time. I moved and moved and moved and moved. So everything had to be small. So I would, I would write comic books that were that big. I, I sometimes I run across some of the writing I did at the age of 9, 10, 11. It's like microprint. It's, it's crazy, and I would do it with fountain pens. I mean, uh, I was a deeply strange child. <laughs> and I really liked fine-tipped things, you know, because otherwise they'd smudge. Um, so storytelling uh, served its function in, a, in any number of ways, uh, both as a survival technique, as a way to escape reality, uh, as a way to uh, bring uh, foreign cultures to other people's attention, uh, all of that stuff uh, as a kid. You know, the, the, the writing serves different functions now, but, but that, that's the provenance. It's, it's been a continuum. I can cast a look over my shoulder and see that the, the writing or the expression of storytelling has pretty much always been there. But I wouldn't have done it without all of you, so I thank you very much. Thank you.